Hello and welcome back to the channel. In this video I'm going to be covering a topic, yeah, another topic that I find fascinating in Grim Dawn, that of monster infrequence. Now, as you can see, John Bourbon's confused. I've just mentioned monster infrequence to him and now he's got a great big question mark over his head. What the heck are those, he wants to know, and how will they benefit me in my journey through the game? Well, monster infrequence are... I'll try and keep this as clear and brief as possible. They're items that drop from particular enemy types, but not all the time. So you won't always get one. So you could kill a particular enemy and you might get this item drop and then you could go and kill him again a couple more times and not get it drop. Infrequent. If they were called monster frequents, it would mean pretty much every time you killed a monster it would drop them, but they're not. They're called monster infrequents. So these things don't drop all the time. Now, they can drop from a type of enemy, for example, there's a, there's a floating eyeball thing called an overseer that drops an overseer's eye. But that these things are in some areas they're all over the place. There's multiple ones, multiple areas where you find these things, and you you'll see this a lot through the game. You'll come across a, a certain type of enemy, certain type of like general trash mob. That you kill them and they drop these things. Um, if you go to the the underground insect lair near Homestead. Where the where you get a quest to, to kill the queen, there are there are things in there that drop a particular type of um, blade, and you can come out of there with like loads, dozens of these things because they they just drop in all the time. So although they're infrequent, there's so many enemies in there that are capable of dropping them. You get quite a few. Other monster infrequents will only drop from, for example, one particular boss in one place. So if you want one of those items, you have to go to that one specific boss and farm him. Kill him over and over again until either you get the item that you want, or if you're generally, when you're in Ultimate and you're doing this, you want things to drop with a particular prefix and or suffix to give you the best version of that item for your build. And that's when it can become <laughs> quite an adventure to, to get the item that you're looking for. But what I'm going to do in this video is show you, I say all. If I've missed any, I'm really sorry. I, it's, there's some uh, I was thinking of deliberately missing. But I tried to include all the monster in frequence that it's possible to get in Act 1. By Act 1, I mean everywhere from Devil's Crossing all the way up to the warden's laboratory. So that's that's that one. Now there's an area east of Burwich Village called East Marsh. East Marsh, there it is. And there's a monster infrequent that drops in that area. Now you're not that area is level scaled similar to the end of Act 3, beginning of Act 4, the level of the enemies. And the quests that you eventually get that send you into that area will require you to have progressed, at least geographically, um, into the start of, era of, of Act 4 before you get the quest to come back here. But what I'll do is I'll show you the item anyway, because geographically it's in Act 1, although not chronologically. Unless you unless you're playing on a you know, an, an, an alt character that's using merits and XP pots and you're just running around all over the place. Um, there's another area near Devil's Crossing where a, a decent monster and frequent item will drop. Again, if, you, if it's your first character you're playing through, you need dynamite to access the area and dynamite won't start dropping until you're in Act 2 anyway. And again, it's, it's quite a high level area because the, well, it, you'll see when I go in there. I'll, I'll go in there on a, on a different character uh, just to just to show where the item is. But let's get back to talking about what are monster infrequence. Well, the first one that you will encounter in the game, possibly. I mean, I can't guarantee this because you could kill this boss, this mini boss, and it might not drop. Now, this item here is a Barog's bloody arm. Now. This will this will always drop with particular attributes on it. 
what's what becomes slightly confusing particularly if you if you watch um lots of other videos of grim dawn and people and people get this item drop if they get it with different prefixes and suffixes it might look like you're you're getting a different bonus on there but the the item itself comes with a a specific set of of attributes on it that that will apply to it and what's interesting is a lot of the well the majority of these monster infrequents the specific buffs they do or damage conversions that they do don't change from you could get you could pick this up I mean this this hasn't even got a level on it it's just got a physique requirement of 62 if you were to pick the one up in ultimate if you look at the bottom of that list of uh, of attributes it's got a plus two to savagery which is a shaman skill plus two to there to, to, to tenacity of the boar which is another shaman skill 15 percent weapon damage to savagery and plus 100 percent bleeding damage to savagery it's all shaman stuff right so that's that's your your bog stat. that's the one that will drop if you go and kill manage to kill this guy at level one that's the thing that will drop and you and, and you'll get those those buffs on us. If you're playing a shaman and you pick that up and you stick one point in savagery, this will buff it up to three points. If you put one point in tenacity of the boar, this will buff it up to three, it'll add two onto it. Whatever weapon you're wielding, well, this one, it'll add fifteen percent of this weapon's damage to savagery. So every time you use the savagery skill to hit something, it will add in fifteen percent of this weapon's damage. And it will add one hundred percent bleeding damage to savagery so when savagery is active and hitting things and causing bleeding damage this will double the amount that you do so that that's what the, the level one or the level zero version of this weapon does that it drops if you remember that plus two savagery plus two tenacity of the ball 15 percent weapon damage 100 percent right over here is a level 94 one that dropped in ultimate um required player level 94 required physique 572 the base damage on that weapon 53 to 148 physical damage obviously much higher than the, the one that drops in in normal with like a level zero weapon but if you look at the 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 unique monster infrequent attributes on this plus two to savagery plus two to tenacity of the ball 15 percent weapon damage 100 percent bleeding damage that that is the same we equip that right so you can see both of them now at the same time so what that's doing if you've got an, if you've got an item equipped and you hover over a similar item like if you've got a weapon equipped and you hover over another weapon it will show both of them so you can compare them and you can see there that apart from the, the base damage and the, the sort of the, the the damage that the item is doing this which really is just like if it wasn't a monster infrequent item, you'd have the base damage would scale up like that from normal up through to ultimate. You pick a weapon up in ultimate, it's going to do a heck of a lot more damage. But when you look at the stuff at the bottom, the unique monster infrequent um, buffs on it, plus two savagery, plus two tenacity, 15% weapon damage, 100% bleeding damage. Um, when this becomes interesting is some items, like say a medal. Now medals, medals don't have like damage or armor scaling on them um, generally I mean, someone will pick me up and tell me I'm wrong here but most of the time if you pick a medal up a monster infrequent medal in normal and it does something like a, a particular type of damage conversion unless you are really keen to get one to drop with a particular prefix and suffix and you want a high level one that's got good resistances on it whatever you could pick that up in normal and, and use it until you go well forever because uh, because the, the 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 attribute changes that you get from it they don't improve with a higher level version so the although on that barrack's bloody arm the damage it's doing is going up as with any weapon that you pick up if you picked up a, a weapon in normal and a similar weapon in ultimate it's going to do more damage but the the monster infrequent specific buffs to the shaman skills on that they do not change from the level zero one right up to the level 94 one so let's have a look at that weapon being obtained now and then we'll move on to the next one
Okay, the next the next item. If you if you follow the campaign through, if you follow the storyline through, and don't just go randomly running off, the next thing that you got a chance to get is this thing, Kaizog's skull. This drops off Kaizog the reanimator in the burial cave. He's the, he's the first. He's the target of the first main campaign quest that you get. Now what this does, this is a a caster offhand. So if you if you're a an arcanist um, and you're doing fire damage and ether damage, there's a arcanist skill Caladol's Tempest that'll do that. So if you've got that. Right. Caladol's Tempest does fire damage, does ether damage. So if you're an arcanist and you're using that skill and you pick this thing up, you think it was your birthday and Christmas all at the same time because it buffs fire damage and ether damage, sticks your offensive ability up so your chance to hit and your critical chance will go up a bit, increases your energy regeneration a whole hell of a lot and you know anyone who's using casting spells all the time you, you're going to know that you, or energy regen you're going to want as much of that as you can get. It's got a skill cooldown reduction on it so you your spells or whatever that you're casting are going to recharge 15% quicker. It puts plus two into Calidor's Tempest, the very skill that it's buffing with fire damage and ether damage buffs. And then it does a whole other bunch of stuff to Calidor's Tempest. Now that, if you, if you remember what I was saying about things not changing, the 50% plus 50% crit damage to Calidor's and those two damage conversions where it converts ether to fire and lightning to fire, that, that won't change. So that low level thing will have those same bonuses on as the high level one. Ignore the bonus to all pets, that's because it's got a subjugator's prefix on it. It wouldn't always drop with that. Um, coming back to what I mentioned in my original damage video about damage conversion, although that's although it's got a plus 34% buff to ether damage on it, what you notice there is it's converting 100% of ether damage to fire damage on Calador's Tempest. So you... <laughs> Yeah, it's great. It, it, you're not going to be doing any ether damage with Calidor's Tempest anymore with this on. But with that plus 56% fire damage, so long as you're aware of that and you know that that's happening, it's not going to be a problem for you. Um, if you've got a load of devotions active that are buffing ether damage because of Calidor's and you equip this item, all of a sudden any buff to ether damage is going to be wasted because the 100% ether has been converted to fire on Calidor's Tempest. That's what I was saying in, in the damage video about make sure you know what you're doing when you equip stuff, read what it's doing, and have a look at your tab 2 and make sure that you can see if you've got a particular got a particular damage, uh, damage type, ether damage plus 34%, fire's at the top and fire plus 56. So if you, shame I haven't got any skill points. I can show you that. Take my word for it. So yeah, so that's the second thing you like to find. I'll now hand over to my able assistant who will show this item being acquired from Kaizog. One thing I probably should have done. Baroz. Am I getting that right? I'll be getting that right. Barog. Barog, Karoz, Kaizog. All gets a little bit confusing when you're my age. Right. Barog's bloody arm. If you come out of Devil's Crossing, follow the road straight through. There's only one way to bury your hill, and that's over this little bridge here. Well, unless you go around that way. So, yeah. That's sometimes blocked, but anyway, you've got to come up here, past this building, and there's a tree, and he's underneath the tree there. He spawns out of the ground just there. So as long as you come straight up, and either you're either heading for that bridge or to take the the long way round to the right, you've got to go up there. If you walk under that tree, you'll jump out of the ground, and then you've got a percentage chance that he's going to drop that arm. And Kaizog, the reanimator, is the target of the quest. He's un he's in the burial cave, which is where the main quest will send you. So if you can't find that, keep looking. 
now you'll find it is dead easy straight over that bridge and then up here and then burial hill is this curvy bit there there's two ways into it you can either come around this way and there's an entrance just up in there actually that's a line no it is it's just around there or there's one around that bit right what i'll do from now on is i won't give loads and loads of detail and keep going on about the same old stuff because we understand now don't we we understand that the the unique monster and frequent attributes don't change f from one version of the weapon to the next as you as you get higher higher level versions um if there's anything that does stand out as possibly change and i'll mention it but i don't think there is next thing is you come out of burial hill and continue forging a path north and what will happen is you'll you'll get some you'll come back and cash that quest in and you'll be given a quest to get some scrap for barnabas right barnabas is this dude down here so you'll be given a quest to cash some scrap in help barnabas out and when you give him the scrap he'll give you another quest and what will happen then is this cellar door will open that's that's not open at the start of the game you've got to do the scrap quest for barnabas and then that will open then you go in there and you will fight a eventually at the end of that area you'll fight a boss called viloth the corruptor viloth the corruptor drops viloth's ring there it is uh it says poisoned on it and it says of blood on it now based on what i know about this <laughs> It will have some acid damage on it, but that off blood looks like it's adding that percent or that plus six percent bleeding damage, which they won't. You won't always have that. What it will have is a acid damage and plus three to Amarasta's blade burst, which is a night blade skill. And you can farm him, and you can get multiple. You can get two of these. Obviously, you can't wear more than two. Put one on there, and you can put one on there. Nothing's going to stop you wearing two of those if you want to. And that will give you a massive plus six to Amarastus Blade Burst, plus it will put your offensive ability up a bit, and a bit of acid damage. So if you're, if you're a Nightblade, particularly if you're a Nightblade who wants to do a bit of acid damage, go and grab them. And this is what he looks like when you kill Viloth and he drops his ring. Okay, next up, there's a side quest that you get from this lady in here. Doesn't look like I've picked want? it up yet. Yeah, Tereni, we'll, we'll be back. We'll be back to sort you out later, mate. Right, Sybil Heart. So she'll give you this quest: find Milton Heart and collect his amulet. Return the amulet to Sybil. What that'll do is that'll put a nice big gold star over Milton's head. Milton, Milton spawns up in the best way to find him is to go up to the foggy bank rift and work down actually I wasn't going to do this because I'll probably die but if you come down this way and keep an eye on your mini map Keep an eye on the left hand side as you're working your way down here. And you'll see a gold star pop up on the mini map sooner or later. Sometimes he's in this building here. Sometimes he's in this building on the right. This time round, it looks like he's over. There he is, right. So there he is, Milton Hart. And he, I'll show you what he looks like. There you go. He's that guy there, like, spewing fire. Oh, look, Milton, just shut up. Yeah, so I haven't got any gear equipped or anything, so I'm not doing any damage. So you kill him. He's got a, he's got a chance to drop this. Milton's cask. It's a helmet. This, if you're playing a soldier, 
this is a really good item to pick up. It, it, it's, um, it actually does some fantastic stuff. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and get some skill points claimed back and then I can show you exactly what this thing does. So there's Blitz. Blitz is a good skill, some ability skill and it deals a lot of damage. And shield training. Shield training is an interesting one. Shield training is in its base form like this. A passive skill that just buffs your shield recovery time and your shield block chance. It's alright. Um, it's not massively powerful, not particularly exciting, but Milton's Cask adds plus three to Blitz, plus three to Overguard, which is a shield skill. It reduces the skill recharge time on Blitz. Adds physical damage to Blitz. And now here's the thing, this is this is the interesting one. 48 physical damage to shield training. Shield training is a passive skill that buffs your shield, buffs shield. It doesn't, it's not an attack skill. What that will do is, that weapon, right, I'll show you what, I'm, what I mean because, right, weapon attack, 63 to 78, actually. I've got to give a better demonstration of this, because the numbers are going to change radically, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why, and you're going to think, well, is he telling the truth? I think he's talking a load of garbage. What we do, we take the point out of shield training. Right, so weapon attack, 63 to 78, so I put that hat on. It's not gone up, right? Weapon attack is not going up. Blitz will. Let's swap a bit of gear around because if you look at shield training, requires a shield. So nothing, nothing will happen <laughs> if I put shield training on or I'm not. So I've got the shield. Um, Blitz is massive because we've got that on. Weapon attack 69 to 89. Weapon down or whatever. 69 to 89. Let's remember those numbers. Should be easy to remember. We've got one point in shield training. Weapon attack is now 139 to 169. That is because Milton's cask has put 50 physical damage into shield training, which has been applied to the weapon damage, and the weapon damage is scaled by, by cunning. So that 50 is actually ending up being more than 50 because you've got a bunch of cunning from that, plus the cunning that the character's got already. There you go. So that's adding bonus physical damage plus 75.5%. So that, for a soldier, if you're using a weapon and a shield and blitz, which which you should be doing, um, if you're playing a soldier, you, yeah, use blitz all the time. Not all the time, but as soon as you can get it. Brilliant item, can't recommend it enough. Go get it. When you come out of Burial Hill and you head west around this area there's the old dump. In the old dump there is a cave that has three possible spawn locations for the entrance and in that cave there is a poisony beast boss called Pusquill. Pasquil the Hoarder. Pasquil the Hoarder hoards gear. And there's, a, there's something interesting about Pasquil. He has a chance to drop his tail, Pasquil's tail. If you look at that, they love night blades, don't they? they this buffs a whole bunch of night blade stuff. Belgothian's Shears. Adds poison damage to it. Plus three to Nidala's Hidden Hand. Reaping Strikes, Necro, Vulnerability is Occultist, yeah. So really if you you get your Vilos ring on for your acid and you grab yourself a couple of those and dual wield them, you'll be laughing for a while as an acid damage Nightblade. Now that's, that's the monster infrequently drops. Pusquill will always drop a Bernard's slightly chewed buckler. This is not a monster infrequent item. It's a it's a rare item. 
and it's guaranteed to drop from Pasquale. You'll always get one. It's not a monster infrequent, so I'm not going to talk about it. However, <laughs> if you're a soldier and you've got Milton's cask and any one-handed weapon, pick that up and use that. It's free. Pasquale will give you one of those for nothing. Let's go and have a look where Pasquale is and see what it's like to kill him and get his, get his stuff. Next up, moving swiftly on from Pasquale in the old dump, past where Milton spawns. Foggy Bank Rift yet again. You get to the Foggy Bank Rift, head northeast, you will come to a cave that is always in the same place. I'll just show you how to get there. Quickest way. We can see it on the mini-map already, the entrance. It's always here. This cave. That's where you want to go. Right. I'll show you how to obtain this item in a sec. So what we're, to, what we're going to get in here is this thing. A putrid necklace. Putrid Necklace is awesome. If you are, again, if you're an acid damage character, any type of acid damage character, but particularly one who has a cultist as a mastery, this is a great item. It will buff a bunch of acidy stuff. It will also buff a bunch of arcanist stuff, specifically Iskandra's Elemental Exchange. But here's the interesting thing, it converts 45% elemental damage to acid damage when you've got Blood of Dreeg up, Blood of Dreeg's an occultist skill, and it will convert 100% of ether damage to acid on Blood of Dreeg. So Blood of Dreeg isn't an attack skill, it's, it's, a, it's a buff that you have to keep triggering, it's not a toggle skill, I think the default time it stays up is 30 seconds you can get all sorts of items this one included that will extend the duration and really that just it's more for quality of life the extended duration doesn't make it stronger it just means that you've got less chance to forget to activate it every 30 seconds there's a medal that much much later on in Ogdenbog that adds a th uh, 30 second yeah, adds another 30 seconds to it. So if you've got this and that medal, plus the default 30 seconds on it, it'll stay up for 70 seconds. And yeah, so it's, it's good. This is a nice item. Um, if, you're, if your character is dealing elemental damage, just be careful because if you've not got a cultist as a mastery, it's not a problem. If you've got a cultist as a mastery, and for some reason you're doing elemental damage, this will convert 45% of that elemental damage to acid damage. The chances of you having an occultist mastery and dealing elemental damage, unless you're a, an early an early game pyromancer, uh, in which case, yeah, don't bother with this because you don't want to be converting your elemental damage to acid. I mean, eventually on Pyro, you're going, to, you're going to be converting as much fire damage to chaos as possible. That's the, that's the best way to get damage out of that build, but um, I'm getting off topic a bit now. So yeah, there you go. So that's that's the Putrid Necklace, and this is the boss you have to, mini boss you have to kill to get it.
if you go up to the Burwich Village Rift and head west into the docks area, same area where you'll get sent on a fabric quest by a lady inside the prison once you get the friendly reputation, there's a cave there, it's always in the same place, not like Pusquills, which can spawn in three different places. You've got Grundlepliss Cave, which is always in the same place. He's like, I don't know, Puskel's brother or something. Right, and this is this is a this is a great weapon if you're a soldier because ignore the ignore all the vitality stuff is showing up, but most of that's there because of the Aldrich prefix. But you're going to get a plus two to fighting spirit. You're going to get minus three second skill recharge to fighting spirit. And here's the big one: eight percent of attack damage converted to health to fighting spirit. Any source of attack damage converted to health is is really good. Okay. There, there's some stuff here for Necro as well, vitality, damage to reaping strike and physical conversion. But the, uh, yeah, that's good. Say you're playing a um, Death Knight, you'll get all that all that benefit. If you're playing any kind of soldier character though, grab this, because watch this, this is great. Here's Fighting Spirit, maxed out. So if you max out Fighting Spirit, it's got 40% chance of activating, and it says it's got a 12 second skill recharge, and it stays up for eight seconds. So you, you take damage, you're in a fight, things are hitting you. You've almost got a 50-50 chance of this activating. 40% chance of activating is good. It's high. Uh, compared to a lot of other things um, in, in the game which have got a chance of activating, 40% is, is a good one, right? It's, you're going to get that happening in a big fight. So it, it's up for 8 seconds, and you've got a 12-second skill recharge. So there's going to be a 4-second gap where it's not up, and it's still recharging. However, good old Grundlepleth, you stick that on there, you can actually see this happening, I'll show you now. The minus three second skill recharge. So you've got, I mean, you've got a weapon that looks really good as well. There's nothing better than running around, smacking people in the face with some dead animal's tail. You, you, that you've got to love it. You've got to love Grim Dawn for this sort of thing. And, and on the skill page, you now see that that has got a nine second skill recharge. Thank you, Grundlepleth. I'll take that. You've got a one second gap between this being up and triggering again. So it's gone up to 14 points out of 12, which has increased the chance of activating to 42%. So it's up for 8 seconds, it's active for 8 seconds, giving you plus 220% to all damage and putting your offensive ability through the roof, plus 265 offensive. I mean, that's really good. It's up for 8 seconds, it's got a 9 second skill recharge. So you've only got a 1 second gap between it being up and potentially getting activated again. So thank you, Grundlepleth. Let's just see you getting killed and dropping your tail. Next up, we have a really nice amulet for a Force Wave Soldier. This thing. Shambler's Heart. Pretty straightforward. Does some physical damage. Offensive ability. Defensive ability. Plus three to Force Wave. Minus three second skill recharge to Force Wave. 
What's interesting about this is if you're using two-handed force wave, you're going to have a zero cooldown on it anyway because of that. If you use tremor, plus 100% skill cooldown reduction. So yes, it's not got one. If you're using force wave with a one-handed weapon, you'll take any skill recharge reduction you can get. It's not the most thrilling monster infrequent in Act 1, but in a one-handed force wave build, you aren't going to find... Well, ground limb, I'd say you, you won't find a better amulet than that for a while if you're a one-handed force wave soldier. I'll tell you where the Shambler is. He's in here. Flooded passage. You're going to flood a flooded passage rift. Go all the way through to the end, and then you have to kill him to get out the other end. You can't get out of the other end of it until you kill him. And this looks something like this. These two items, I've got them dropping from enemies in the run-up to the fight with Warden Krieg in the laboratory. It's a whole load of enemies that drop these mutant bludgeons. And I mentioned this right at the start, these, the floating big eye thingies, the overseers, they'll, they'll have a chance to drop this. Now that thing has got some lightning damage on it and you can see it buffs stun jacks. Stunjax is a demolitionist skill, so you might want to mess around with that. If you're playing a caster that uses demolitionist skills, that that goes really well with the Shambler heart because that's a single-handed weapon. Does force wave damage? It also reduces the force wave recharge. And extends the range of it. The blast wave of force wave is extended, the distance it travels, so you hit things that are further away. So if you want to pick up um, Milton's cask for your blitz and your shield training damage buff, one of those things for force wave. Bernard's slightly chewed buckler. Or later on, when we get to this, we'll talk about Warden Krieg's shield. I mean, that dumps all over that one. If you want to look at some really good soldier kit. So you can you can see here, you can kit yourself out with monster infrequence. And the thing is, although, although these don't always drop, you know it's eventually, it's a guaranteed drop, you'll get it. And it's not like a dice roll for the stats. You'll always get the, the blitz buff off that, the shield training buff, the force wave skill reduction, sorry, cooldown reduction, the force wave buffs and the cooldown reduction and whatever that's going to give you, which we'll talk about in a minute. So you, you can go after these things. It's called target farming. Well, I didn't make that up. Grim Dawn didn't originate that phrase it means f farming where you know where you can specifically go after something and you know it's going to drop eventually I've got a video up where um, I'm trying to farm an item called the Mad Queen's Claw it's level 94 legendary monster infrequent legendary monster infrequent obviously their their um, their attributes are a heck of a lot more fixed. I mean, there's some flexibility, there's some movement in some of the figures on there, but they don't have prefixes and suffixes, not like these. If you if you get what's called a triple rare, that's where you've got a rare prefix and a rare suffix on a monster infrequent rare. If you get, if you get appropriate prefixes and suffixes roll on the item, it can be particularly the you know when you start getting the, the ones dropping ultimate they can be a lot stronger than legendary items but again it's all down to what prefix and suffix drop on there and you're at the mercy of the the grim dawn random number generator let's get back to these two things so these drop in the in the area 
well, one place you can get them is the run up to the fight with Krieg in the laboratory. Um, I won't say too much more about them because these two items. Now, Warden Krieg is is got on like an interesting set of monster and frequent drop chances because he can drop this shield, which again, if you look at that, buffs Blitz, adds physical damage to Blitz. There's a whole bunch of stuff's got retaliation actually has it the vengeance thing might be adding the retaliation damage on there don't take my word for it but all that blitz stuff that's all that's all going to be on there it's it's a really good shield for a one-handed soldier so he can drop that he can also drop this now if you're doing a if you're doing a, a necro pet build go and get one of these and because of what i was saying earlier about how the stats the actual the, the burned in MI, the monster and frequent stats don't change. So on this thing, you got a plus one summon limit to raise skeletons. That means you get you you can raise an extra one. So whatever you, whatever number of skeletons you can currently raise on your necro with your with your summon skeletons, your raise skeleton skill, this will add one on there. So if you can only summon three, you'll be able to summon four with this on. Now, what I've done before with a, a skeleton summoning necro is grab one of these in normal and just not bother you don't bother changing it until something really good version of it dropped in ultimate it's no, you know it's no point thinking well i'll get i'll get a better one in elite you might not it might do a little bit more damage but as a pet a pet um, character you're not worried about what damage you do and if you look at the thing on there it says bonus to all pets now this one it will always it will always drop with a very high conversion of physical damage to ether. This one's got 100%. That's not that's not shocking. It's like you'll often get them drop with 100% physical damage converted to ether. You'll get it occasionally drop with slightly less, 90 something. But anyway, that's you've got to be aware with that of that. So if you've got pets that do physical damage, they're no longer going to be doing physical damage. But because a lot of the devotions the buff pets buff all damage it doesn't matter but what you notice if you're playing a necro and you've got the skill up that debuffs enemies against ether damage like lowers their resistance to ether damage then that's really good so those two now the interesting thing about Krieg he can drop either of those or both of them he can drop both of them at the same time that can happen um, the ch chances of you playing a character where that's beneficial are remote. I mean, unless you're playing some kind of weird Death Knight pet summoner, um, which isn't that bizarre, but I don't think it's a popular build. I've done a Death Knight summoner, but I didn't use the shield and that thing. Uh, I used something else. I used the, I used the weapon, it's not the shield some kind of summoning offhand um right so let's so those are good but like i said if you if you don't get this thing dropped from Cree, just run you know and you really want one run back through and get him but if you're playing a pet build and you get one of those weapons drop don't worry about farming for another one or thinking you're going to get a better one in elite just don't worry about it because that plus one summer limit to skeletons and the bonus tool pets that's on there you'll always get that it won't change Next up, we have a monster in frequent from another unique boss called Gutworm. Now, our Gutworm is always in his cave, 
the cave entrance has three random points on the map. Well, three points on the map where it can randomly spawn. You've got the place where I am here, and there's another area over here where it can spawn, and there's a third area close to where you would originally meet Olgrim by the stream. So if you if you search each of those three areas, you'll find it eventually, or you might find it straight away. It looks like that. It doesn't appear on the map. You'll notice that the actual cave entrance, because normally you'd get a, um, a point of interest, Sauron's eye kind of job going on, showing you where like that cave entrance. But this cave entrance doesn't show because it's hidden. And the many hidden things in Grindorn. So you go in here and you fight Gutworm, and you probably die. He's quite tough. But he drops an item, a monster and frequent item, so we're in here to get him. He's down there. Right. And didn't drop it, of course, because that's the way life is. He's got a one shot chest in here as well, so you can get some stuff out of that. Actually, I, I'm lying. It's not a one-shot chest. I'll wind that one back. That chest will always be there. It's not a one-shot chest. Tell it's not a one-shot chest because there's no epic or legendary item in it. Right, I'll reset the game, come back, try again. What will happen now is the, the cave with a bit of luck will spawn in with one of the other locations, so I can show you that. Here's one of the other places it can spawn, just so you can see it. It would be there on that rock. And we are here. So there's the Burwich Village Rift, you come down this path and there's that kind of concave looking bit of rock. That's where it would be. Jog across to the other location. Right, so the other the other location is near the stream we have met Algrim. Let's across here and down a little bit. Right. So you get to this area where Algrim would originally. I think it'll stop following me. I don't know what I'm do it. Right, so originally, when you first met Algrim, he would have been here. If you go east and up a little bit. That's the other location where Gutworm's cave would have spawned, but it's not there. So it's going to be in the same place it was last time we were here. It used to be repeatedly spawning here. Let's go and kill him again. Please drop your item, mate. You're getting tedious. And there he is. Hooray, he's dropped it. He has, thank you, because I really didn't want to have to do that again. Gutworm's Mark. So as you can see with that, pierce damage, cold damage, cunning. Actually, forget the cold damage. I suspect that's only on there because of the Rhyme Frost prefix. So you're looking at pierce damage, bleeding damage, and some stuff to <sighs> deadly momentum, circle of slaughter, Circle Slaughter's a Nightblade skill, bleeding damage over two seconds to Cadence. So if you were playing a Blade, Blade Master, Blade Dance, or whatever it's called, the Nightblade and Soldier the Dual Mastery, that would be a good one for you. The next monster in Frequent I'm going to try and get for you is dropped by a boss called Salazar, who only exists in one place, and you need a key to unlock a door to get into the area where you find it. Now you can get the key either by being friendly with Dereni, who you will find standing here by this tent. He's no longer there because I killed him, so I didn't get the key from him. The other way to get the key is as a random drop from a blood sworn type enemy. Now, there are two areas where you can encounter them. If you go up to the Foggy Bank Rift, follow the path down to this 
area here. And there's a ruined house. These guys have a chance to drop the key. them down inside. As with all the random drops in Grim Dawn, you might have to farm an area for a while. Or you might get lucky the first time. There it is. So that's that's what you're looking for. A strange key. The key is marked with many strange runes and depraved symbols, characteristic of the cult of Chihuahua. Right? So you pick that thing up. There it is in your inventory. Now you need to travel up to Burwich Outskirts Rift. Head east until you get to the track between some walls. Head southeast until you find this bit of wall that you can break. Can't do that yet. Okay. And in this area are more of these blood sworn chappies who can drop the key. I think they may still drop it even though I've got one, but we only need one. See, it's dropped again there. I don't need to kill him, I just need to head to where the locked door is. Which is right over here, the easternmost side. There it is. So that says, iron door locked, but because I've got the key, I can open it. It's actually a quest, you get some XP for getting in here. The quest was a strange key, I've got some XP. So you work your way through this area, you get the salads off. I won't bother killing him, I'll just run past him where possible. Right, if you come in here at what the game determines to be too low a level, so say normal, if you came in here, you, you could accidentally come in here at level 5 or 6 or something, you'd get a message pop up saying that something like there's a, there's a presence within this area who is much stronger than you. This door is, is, a, is a one way only. Once you go through that and it locks behind you, you can't come back out. So the only way to get out is to map out, rift out, and Salazar is up there. Now then, if he drops the sword, I think it's a sword, God, is it a sword or a dagger? Pretty sure, it's, pretty sure it's a sword. If he drops the sword, my work here is done. If not, I'll have to do this again. There he is, Salazar Blade of Chathon. And of course he didn't drop it. Rat bag. Okay, while I'm here. <coughs> there's a one-shot gold chest and there's also a room. There's a one-shot gold chest and there's also a room with a whole load of other chests that are always there. So if you come in to fight Salazar, it's always worth going a little bit further just to get this other stuff. There's the one-shot gold chest, so that's only there the first time. Once you open that, it won't spawn there again. And as with all of them, you're always going to get one blue or one legendary item, if you're lucky. They're actually not that bad. 
<coughs> right, this room up here. <coughs> what is up with my throat? Right, this room up here, these chests are always in there. And although that looks like it could be a one-shot chest, it's not. It's just got really good stuff in it. And it's always there. As is that one, as is this one. I'll open this one last, see what we get. Might get something nice. Or not. Right, what I'll do is I'll try again. Um... But I haven't got to pick the key up again. Once you've unlocked that door, it's permanently unlocked. So what I'll do is reset. Actually, I'll just do it. Yeah. So this is this is how you might have to farm this guy. You reset the game. Go back in. Right. There it is. So this is why we this is why we're coming in here to kill him. We want that thing. Salazar's Sovereign Blade. What we see with this It's good for what's the wrong button job. What are you doing? Right, where's it gone? There it is. Salazar's Sovereign Blade. As you can see with this, it's got got vitality damage and decay on it but really why you'd want this is if you were a particular type of summoner pet summoner it's got plus two to summon hellhound plus two to summon familiar and it's got a granted skill call forth the harbinger right so what that does if i take this off and put that on it gives you a skill call forth the harbinger right so if you do that there he is you can summon this thing, it'll fight with you. He's a bit slow. Come on, mate, you've got to keep up. You've got to get in there and start brawling. Like all pets, you can change his disposition so he's aggressive. Look how bad he is. <laughs> And he's gone because he only lasts for a certain amount of time. Worth pointing out, I mean, he's, I'm not playing a pet build, so I've got no skills that buff pets. If, you, if you've got a pet build and you've got skills that buff pets, he'll be a lot more useful for you than he is for me. There's that chest again. It's always there. As are these others. There you go. So that was that, was that monster infrequent. Salazar Sovereign Blade. And if it, if it drops with a pet affix or suffix, it's going to be even better for you on a pet build. So next monster in Frequent, this, although it's in, technically it's in Area 1, he, the area is higher level, a lot higher level than the other stuff in Area 1. And it is the map location where you would come to the end of the Hidden Path quest. Now, because the, if you play through the game normally without using Maris to skip around rifts you won't be you won't be getting to the end of the hidden path quest until you've reached act start of act four and you could be depending on how you're playing high mm -hmm. high thirties early forties or if you're me playing with xp pops in a low car set you could be in your fifties so you come back at that point well, you can go here at any time but you want to be level up enough to be able to deal with this area. So you travel east-ish from the Burridge Village Rift. I'll show you where I am on the map when I get here. Once I clear this one. Anybody follow me? No. So you go to the Burridge Village Rift, you come down this southeast path, almost straight down to here. You get to this. You need to first of all, you need one dynamite to clear the repair site. Then you need ten scrap and eight thousand iron bits to repair the bridge. Now, what I would say, there's several things to do in this area. If you're only coming in here for the monster infrequent, my in my opinion, the best way to get to it, is follow the 
stay as, as far north as you can around the main loop of this landmass. Don't head up the, that track. Don't go up there because that's leading into a new area that they added in in a recent patch. No, but don't go down there. So can't just stay in the northernmost part of the landmass all the way around. And you can fight these things if you, if you feel so inclined. I'm just running away from them because I just want to get to the monster and frequent boss guy. And this is quite a long run. You, you kind of hope he drops. Okay, it's a shield. It's a very nice shield he drops for. I've, I've used the shield. As I was saying, the shield he drops is very nice. Got a lot of bleeding damage on it, and I used it on a dervish Eye of Reckoning character. I might, might do a video on that at some point, although it was really a joke, because I was talking to somebody about this whole spin to win thing, and I said, well, I've never done one of those, because it's just it's just a, it's just a massive meme, and it's it, everyone's going on about it at the time of how it was a great build. But it's so much fun, spinning around everywhere. It, it, it doesn't really feel like you're like, like you're playing the normal character because you're not. Anyway, let's show you where I am. Right, so I came into this area over that bridge and as you can see I've just followed, I mean there's loads more of it down here, I followed this, like I say, staying to the north part of the, of the landmass. Don't go into this new area here because you can't get out of it. Well, the only way back out is that way. So this is where I am at the moment and I'm going to keep going until I find this bit of rock and stuff and then you have to loop back on yourself up here and go into this undead area actually that reminds me see now there's a monster in frequent that I wouldn't have said was I wouldn't have said was an Act 1 Monster Infrequent, because this isn't really Act 1, but no, we'll talk about that another day. Okay, there's a bunch of undead that are going to jump out the ground. Right, so when you finally clear that lot out, I mean, although although this is a bit of a windy path, it's still if you if you concentrate on staying as far north as possible until you can't go any further and then looping round, you're following the edge of the landmass pretty much all the way around to here. Now this this is where the boss is. He can be quite dangerous. He does bleed damage and whatever. I mean, I shouldn't have a problem with him. I want, I want to show you him before he attacks me. There he is up there. Right. Kaliskar the Bone Hunter. He's this... There he is. Right. He didn't see me. He's very sure. Right. So he's... He's going to... He's going to be a really good doggy and he's going to drop this monster frequent for me. Aren't you, Kalis? Let's go. Give me a shield. You want to see him? It's a nice shield. Callus Car's a good old boy. I suspect the drop chance on this is quite high because it always seems to drop. Same as with um, Chillwindy dude over in near Twin Falls. Right. So there's his shield. If you have a look at that. Physical damage, bleeding damage, shield block chance. Blade Ark, Soldier, Presence of Virtue, Oath Keeper. Does, it adds physical and bleeding to Blade Ark, and it adds a bunch of stuff to Presence of Virtue. Like I said, I, I was using this on a, a Dervish, which is a Nightblade and an Oath Keeper, on a, a spinning 
Eye of Reckoning build. It also looks really good. Look at that thing. Let's stick that on so you can see what it looks like. Come up here. Look at the blood spit. Turn around. There you go. A little bit more. Look at the blood spewing off that. That's that's a beautiful thing. Finally, we get to the last monster in frequent I want to show you. This is the one that's in the first hidden path area. Accessed down this track down the side of the house. Or you can go in the house and smash the bookcase and come out through that. The house we, we're heading towards is up here on the right. It's that one there. You can go down this side path. You can see where it is there. You come out of Devil's Cross and it's, you stay to the right and you'll eventually get to it. Come down here. And on the map you're not showing up as being anywhere because it's a hidden path. That's where you have to use the two pieces of dynamite. These are the creatures that drop the weapon we're after. A Rift Scourge Slicer. The character I'm playing actually is dual wielding these at the moment. See what I mean about it being dangerous. If you go in at a low level, you're just going to get annihilated by the poison damage those things do. And there it is. Rift Scourge Slicer. So they drop one. You're generally going to get one, maybe two if you're lucky, on a run through there. It's 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 unlikely you wouldn't get one drop at all because there are a hell of a lot of the creatures that drop that thing running around in here. Those poison damage beetle things. This is great. As you can see, I'm. Well, if you pause the video there, you can see I'm dual wielding. We'll give you a better look at it now. I'm dual wielding these things because the character I'm playing is Acid Damage, Nightblade, Witch Hunter. Witch Hunter's Nightblade and Occultist, the the acid damage from that and the skills it buffs are... It's the best weapon I could find. Ultimately, I'm going to equip the Mad Queen's Claw, dual wield the Mad Queen's Claw on this character. And what I'm, what I'm expecting is that I'll get versions of this Rift Scourge Slicer drop with decent prefixes and suffixes that will probably be better than the Mad Queen's Claw. Thanks very much for watching that. Hope you enjoyed it. Bourbon enjoyed it. He's no longer got a question mark over his head. He's now got an exclamation point because he wants to know when the next video is coming out. I've no idea, John. It'll be done when it's done, as always. Once again, thank you for watching. I do hope that was that was worth the time, even if you only invested a minute or two looking at the bits you're interested in. I do what I do. If it's good, if you like it, excellent. If not, I've done it, so I can't take it back. Cheers, I'll see you in the next one.